The next talk is John Sonmez. He's going to be talking to us about marketing yourself to boost your career. Um, John and I are in a mastermind group together, and uh, uh, we record it every week, and you can listen to it at entreprogrammers.com. He also have an, has another podcast called Get Up and Code, uh, which is also very inspiring, I found. And, uh, yeah, he's written a book called Soft Skills about uh, building your career and done a whole lot of other stuff. Um, and he blogs at simpleprogrammer.com. So, uh, yeah, I'll quit saying nice things about John, and uh, I'll let him take it away from here. All right. Thanks, Jack. Thanks. And thanks for having me. Thanks for all of you, especially in the UK, that are not, not just uh, in your staying up late and, and, and hanging on till the end. I'll try not to make this boring. I'll try to make this as exciting as possible. And I want to make this as interactive as possible, which is something that is probably challenging to do on an online conference. So, uh, so what, uh, you know, normally when I give this talk, I am in a room full of people and I get up and walk around the room and get people to, you know, answer back to me. But, uh, but you can only type unless, unless you can activate all your mics, which probably is not, not a good idea. So, so here's what I'll do. Uh, we'll probably actually finish up a little bit faster than normal since, uh, since it won't be as interactive during the presentation. Um, if you have a burning question during the presentation, uh, go ahead and ask. Um, in fact, I mean, if you have a question, if I see it and, and it's, it's relevant, I'll just go ahead and answer it in, in the presentation. But, um, but afterward, if we finish up early, I'll just kind of open it up to general Q&A and we'll probably spend some time going over that because there's a lot of areas that we can go and nothing is off limits with me. So you, know, you can ask about my, uh, my cat. Which actually, I don't have a cat. So. <laughs> John, really quickly, you're a little bit quiet. Oh, I am. Oh, okay. Let me just... All right, I just jacked up the gain. How am I sounding now? Much better. Okay. We can also cool. switch into Q&A mode if you want people to raise their hands. Oh, I see. And, okay. Well, I'll keep an eye on the chat window here. Okay. And uh, I can see it here. Since, since I'm not going to be typing any code, it'll be, it'll be easier. Okay. So uh, let's uh, let's get started here. So uh, this this presentation is, of course, on marketing yourself to boost your career. Uh, marketing gets a bad rap in the software development industry. I'm aware of this. Uh, so I'm going to try and kind of change your mindset a little bit on this and try to sort of explain I'm to you gonna, why. Oh, I'm going to go stop you one more time. Can you gain down just a hair? Because you're peaking. Oh, I'm peaking now. Okay. Oops. Okay, how is this? Let me let me get really excited. Am That's I, better. Am I good? Okay, all right. So um, so anyway, marketing gets a bad rap in the software development industry. I know why. You know, we 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 all kind of understand why this 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 happens, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. And I kind of want to show you in this in this uh, in this in this talk about you know why you should actually market yourself and and how you can do this and how it can benefit you. So. Um, you probably are wondering why you should listen to me about marketing uh, yourself. Well, uh, you know, I, I started out not knowing anything about this topic, didn't intend to market myself, but um, it ended up getting me a, a pretty cool career. I mean, my job now is I run a blog called simpleprogrammer.com, and I get to type blog posts and help software developers and write books and do courses and all kinds of cool stuff. That uh, you know that I never imagined I would be doing for a job. Now you don't have to do you know a job like mine, but my point is that it opened up a huge amount of opportunities for me that being able to market myself, and uh, and this is something that's extremely valuable whether you're a career developer, a freelancer, or you want to be an entrepreneur. So I started out in 2009. I really had no blog. I was you know you could search John Sonmez on the internet, and and you know maybe one 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 thing would come up. <laughs> But, um, but in, by 2004, 14, now I guess it's 2015, um, I was able to build up a blog that gets about 100,000 page views a month. I did 55 plural site courses, been on that podcast list is, is pretty incomplete. I think, I think I'm at like 26 podcasts now that I've been interviewed on. Uh, you know, I had, had a lot of success with Hacker News, you know, some of my blog posts. 
and I just published a book through Manning. So, you know, all this is not to brag, it's just to say that this is what I've been able to do in a very relatively short period of time, and, and, and I want to show you how to do it faster, right? Because I didn't know what I was doing, right? I didn't have a formula. I had no idea. I just started a blog, and you know, things started happening, and I started learning as I, as I was going. But you know, one of the things that I really wanted to do when I had the success was to go back and say, okay, now, you know, what's the most valuable thing I could give to someone who was in my shoes back in 2009? And that's that's sort of you know, that's where this talk came from. That's where uh, my product, how to market yourself as a software developer, came from. Was this idea of, okay, now can I give you a shortcut to do essentially what I've been able to do, uh, because I, I think I think it's actually a lot easier than most people think. So let's get into get into it. I love this quote from Jay Z. It's I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man. <laughs> it's, uh, it's 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 a little subtle, but it's a, it's just a totally different mindset, a different way of thinking when you think of yourself as a business, right? This is something that I never had considered. Until, until I really started going down that entrepreneurial road and, and start to look at, at marketing myself. But essentially, we are all businesses, right? Uh, we may have just one client. If you're working for uh, an employer, that's your client. But you still have a business, right? It, it's still like being a blacksmith of old times where you set up shop. You know, you could set up shop somewhere else, you know, just because you have one client. A lot of, uh, in fact, a lot of companies, uh, actually have one client, one major client that they would collapse that client, you know, fill out even a lot of freelancers, a lot of entrepreneurial type of ventures have one major client. So, you know, as a career developer, you're not really that different. But having this mindset of being a business is critical because it changes the way that you think about a lot of things, right? Businesses, they have to go out there and market themselves. Businesses control their brand and control their image. Businesses Think about things that will help generate more revenue for them, and uh, and uh, so so these are things that that maybe you should start considering uh, as as a software developer. Something that I didn't consider for a while, but it's really valuable. Okay, so this guy here, who <laughs> uh, I, I'm sure you guys probably recognize, Bill Clinton, uh, you know, former president of the United States. Um, so in the chat room here, tell me, uh, you know, let's type some numbers here. How much do you think this guy gets paid to speak one time at like an event? Like if we had him here, how much would Chuck have to pay Bill Clinton to speak? Okay, I'm seeing some numbers. Okay, so I think it uh, looks like Brandon Hayes is probably about the closest. It was, it was like around $200,000, maybe it's more now. The last time I checked, it was around two hundred thousand dollars. So now here's a, here's another question here. Why do you think that he gets paid so much to speak? And and I'll and and I'll throw out some possible ideas here. Do you think that he gets Bill gets paid so much to speak because he's such a phenomenal speaker that if you hear this guy speak, it is just worth two hundred thousand dollars. Like it, it will change your life so drastically, so completely that it, it is worth that much money to pay this guy. Or do you think that perhaps part of the reason why he gets paid so much to speak one time is because of his name, right? So I, I now I don't want to knock uh, you know Bill Clinton's speaking ability. I've never heard him speak in you know in a, in a conference or something. I'm sure he's a really really good speaker. He must be right because he speaks so much. But I would guess that the main factor that that influences how much money he makes for speaking is, is not his skill, but his name. And so this is something really interesting to think about as a software developer, because I would say that you are in the same situation. And before you know, you shake your head and say, no, 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 it's not quite the same thing. Let's look at a couple of other examples. Uh, one, one really good one that someone pointed out to me is, uh, are you familiar with Judge Judy? You know, she's like a, a television judge that's popular here in the US. And uh, she makes $47 million a year. At least this is what, what I was told. Now, can you guess how much a Supreme Court justice makes uh, a Supreme, in the U.S. Supreme Court? It's about uh, around $200,000 a year. So, um, so, so, the, so the difference is, again, a huge difference because of her name, right? If you look at uh, celebrity chefs, same thing happens here, right? Is Rachel Ray or, you know, that... Who's that angry chef? I forget his name all the time. But but anyway, these celebrity chefs, they make a lot more money 
not because they're so much more skilled, although they are skilled, but because of their name. So, so here's the thing that, that I, would, I would say to you, is that it, there's this formula, and, it, and it, you, you, know, you could call it uh, style uh, times substance, or substance times style equals money, right? Equals how much you get paid. And in the software development world, maybe we would say skills times marketing or exposure or however you want to you know, call it equals pay. And so a lot of software developers, right, myself included for a while, we focus just on the skill part, try to be the best that we can. Now you have to have skill, right? If you, if you try to promote uh, you know, style without substance is called fraud. We don't want to be fraud. We don't want to you know, pretend, represent something that, that doesn't exist. But I would say that in that equation, the marketing part, the, the exposure, the building a name and authority for yourself is the greater, is the multiplier to skill, and that's where the real money comes from. And you can see this in the software development world. A lot of the, the highest paid software developers, they are, they, they have some kind of authority. They are many celebrities in their, in their areas, and that, and that it, uh, results in an enormous amount of, of potential uh, career-wise, of, of money-making-wise. You know, wherever you want to go, there's a lot of opportunities. It doesn't just have to be about making money. It could just be about the opportunities. Perhaps you want to work for a company like Google or Microsoft because you, you dream of working for that company. So, or, or you want to get on your own and be a freelancer, an entre entrepreneur, an entreprogrammer, right? So anyway, uh, so that's, that, that's really why marketing yourself is important uh, because it's going to allow you to make a lot more money with the same skills that you have right now. Okay, so let's talk about the game plan here that, that we're going to use. This is, uh, this is my buddy Pat Flynn. Actually, Chuck had him on one of his podcasts. He didn't even remember they did it on the freelancer show. Uh, you know, be before Pat got so, so famous with his, uh, he has a, a podcast called uh, Smart Passive Income and a, and a pretty popular blog. But he, he has a strategy that I really liked when I heard it, uh, which is, is called Be Everywhere. And this is pretty cool. Uh, what this means is essentially like, you know, whatever your, your, your niche is or your specialty, when someone goes and looks in that area, they should find you, right? So Josh just presented on Meteor, right? So we could say, you know, Josh said he lives and breathes Meteor. So if that's his specialty, right? If I go on YouTube and start looking up Meteor stuff, hopefully I find Josh. If I go and search the web and look at blogs and tutorials, Hopefully I find Josh. If I listen to podcasts that are talking about Meteor, hopefully I hear Josh, right? That would be being everywhere. Um, and, that's, and that's what we really want to try to do inside of our niche. And each one of us as a software developer should have some kind of a specific niche that is going to, uh, you know, define us, set us apart, give us an area to be an authority. I mean, in order to do that, right, we need to build a brand. Um, just like a company, right, remember we're thinking of ourselves, like a business, so you need to uh, build your own personal brand. I'm going to show you how. There's there's a lot to it, but I'm going to give you kind of the overview. Um, that brand needs to have some brand recognition, right? So building a brand doesn't really do you any good, except that you can show your mom and say, look at look at my logo and, and my cool website. Um, if if people don't recognize it, right? So that requires multiple exposures to the brand, uh, and then we need to create some social proof around that. So um, if you shop on Amazon, uh, how, how many of you, you know, you go out to Amazon, uh, what, what do you do when you search for an item on Amazon, right? Um, if you're like me, what you do is you go and you search and you look at how many reviews there are, right? And if I see a product and it has five, only five reviews, and they're all five star, that doesn't mean anything to me. I think, okay, you know, whatever. But if I see a product that has like 2,000 reviews, and it has an average of like 4.8 stars, I, I don't even have to look anymore. So social proof is enough to tell me that that thing is good and I should buy it, right? Because enough people have spoken. So social proof is powerful and you want that working for you. If a lot of people say, hey, you know, uh, you know I'm gonna keep on picking on Josh as he presented, but if, if a lot of people say, Josh is, is this dude knows Meteor. This guy taught me Meteor. This, you know, uh, that's gonna result in a lot of credibility and, and a lot of promotion for Josh's personal brand. So people are going to come and they're going to want to listen to, pay him uh, for, for meteor type of training and information. Um, and then finally, we need to create the right connections. But I've tried to de-emphasize this part because a lot of 
what we've heard about marketing or you know, getting out there in the software development world is about networking. And I, and I don't like the word networking because I think about you know handing out recruiters handing out business cards at, at meetup events. And that's not networking. That's like that's a thing that you've done. But you know, creating the right connections is a lot more than that. It's about developing real relationships with people. It's about building trust. It's about uh, you know, it, it's about more than just trying to get something out of someone. A lot of the networking that we do is sometimes geared around, okay, I'm looking for a job, so who can help me? Where you know, really creating the right connections is about building long time relationships, not just when you need something. It's about giving value first, giving before you take. So, uh, so, so we'll focus on on that towards the very end. But these other things I think are more important to start out because uh, they're they're definitely less well known, um, and, and you can definitely find a lot of information about them. Okay, so uh, any questions so far at this point with the with the game plan before we start diving in here? Okay, I will move on. Okay. So uh, getting started here. So the, the best place that I think to, to really build your presence online and, and build your brand is your, your own blog, right? Um, I'm, I'm very committed to this idea that software developers need to have a blog. And, and the reason why a blog is so important is because it is the place on the web that you control the message, right? Part of building a brand, as we'll talk about in a little bit here, is about having a good and consistent, clear message that you control. If you don't have that, it's going to be really hard to build a brand. There's a lot of other places out there on the web, right? I mean, you can go to Tumblr and you can go to YouTube and you can go to Facebook and Twitter and all this stuff. And those are good, but that shouldn't be your home base because you don't own that. You don't control that, right? So that's this. This is something that you control, especially if you have your own domain. If you have a blog and you don't have your own domain, go buy a domain right now and and, and set that up because you want to have your own domain, something that you own. And um and and this is kind of the key the key thing. Uh, the blog is the place where, like I said, you can control the message. If you want to change what area you're focusing on, what your specialty is, you can do that because the blog is is something that belongs to you. So uh, let me let, let me uh, again, you know, kind of where does this all fit in here, right? So in your bigger strategy of marketing yourself, right? What you want to essentially do is send people to your blog. I just saw the Roger Wilco there, <laughs> but uh, you want to send people to your blog. Now um, you're going to use social media, right? You're going to spread your message through social media. You're going to have your resume out there, maybe on LinkedIn and stuff like that. You're going to do some branding, and you're going to do maybe some books, articles, podcasts, things like that to get your name out there and get your message out there. But you ultimately want to send people back to the place that you control, the central place that is your message, which is your blog, right? You want to have a home base on the web. All these other outposts out there are good and they're going to help you build your brand and help you get your name out there. But you got to have that central place where you can control the message. And you know, a little bit more advanced tactic would be that you maybe you set up an email list and you collect email addresses on that blog, and that becomes really your, your core. But for now, let's just say you you got to have a blog out there, and that's where you're going to try to direct people because that's where you control the message. Uh, so uh, I'm going to I'm going to give you a kind of a quick overview on creating a blog because um, in, in fact you know, I guess we can try this online. But normally when I give this talk, I say okay. Raise your hand if you have created, if you have a blog. So go ahead and type uh, yes in the chat if you have a blog. Yeah, medium counts. If you have any kind of blog out there. Okay, so I'm seeing a bunch of yeses. I'm trying to, it's hard to gauge the number. So there's about 44 people in here, and then uh, I don't know, I'm seeing like maybe. Was it twenty percent have blogs? Okay, so now now we do the second round of this. Now I say say yes in the chat room. In fact, say um let let's say uh, let's say hell yes <laughs> in the chat room if you have a blog that you have updated in the last month. This way we can separate it from the yeses. <laughs> hey, this is actually much better than what I normally see. Okay, now it's going to get challenging. Okay, now. 
Uh, oh, I, I better not escalate this with any more, uh, you know, with any profanity or anything. But let's let's say um, let's say oh yes, if you've updated your blog every week, at least once a week for the past four weeks. Be honest. Okay, so I see two. Oh, I see an oh no from the Kool Aid Man. Okay, so so two, right? Two out of forty-five people that are in here. I guess I guess maybe forty-four if you don't count me. But um, normally it's even less than that, right? You you guys are are a special breed because you're up. You know, a lot of you are up late at night, and this is an online conference. Um, but but I will I will routinely give this talk at a conference with uh, two hundred people in the room. And sometimes one person will raise their hand that they have updated their blog every week. And and if I ask like, have you done it 52 times in the last 52 weeks? Usually even that hand goes down. So you know my my point here is that it just like if you get nothing from this talk at all, if you only got one thing from it, all you would need to know is that if you create a blog, right, and you update that blog once a week, you're going to be in. For the more majority of the time, of course, in this room it's a little different. But you'll be in the 99 percentile of developers. In fact, you will be. You'll be in in the 99.99 percentile because uh, we're just talking about people that go to conferences. If you look at all the developers out there, right? As far as marketing yourself, you're going to be in the top one percent, the top 0.001 percent of developers if you create a blog and you simply update it every week. Now that's not you know not a magic formula for success, but if you just did that one thing, if you did nothing else, you would see huge results in your career. And I'm not lying to you. You know, test me on it. Do it for a year and see what happens. You're going to get recruit. You're going to get uh, job offers. You're going to get opportunities. You're, there's going to be a lot of good. Plus, you're just going to grow as a person from from writing and, and organizing your thoughts. But I don't want to sidetrack uh, too much. Uh, there, there's a question here on is more than once a week uh, worth it, and I would say I would say yes, but it's really hard to maintain. Um, when I first started out, I tried to blog three times a week, and I did that for about six months. That gave me a nice head start, and it, it built up some content for me. So if you can do that when you first start out, that's really good. But it's really difficult to do. Um, it would be better to to write one quality post every week, in my opinion, rather than than three kind of core quality posts. Not that you should be perfectionist or anything. It's most important to shit. But um, but yeah, that's uh, and and I'll I'll give a quick plug here. I'll I'll go ahead and type it in. Um, if you want to sign up for a free blogging course that I have, uh, you can go to devcareerboost.com forward slash blog dash course. So um, and that and I go through a lot more detail and, and show you exactly how to set up a blog. But um, okay, so let's get into into creating a blog here. If you if now now you should be inspired to create a blog. I hope, right? So um, so how do you do this? There's three main options that you can use here. I'm simplifying things, of course, right? There's a billion different options, but essentially it boils down to this choice. You can use a free service like WordPress.com, Tumblr, Blogger, right? You can use some kind of a paid hosting where where they essentially let you install your own blogging software, but they control the operating system. And they charge you like a, a small monthly fee, like let's say around ten dollars a month, and and you're you're shared with other people that are running on that same server. Or you can use virtual private server, which is what I'm running simple programmer on right now because it gets a lot of traffic. And it's essentially a, a a Linux box in the cloud that I control the OS and I install everything on. And when the Heartbleed bug comes I have to panic and freak out because I need to update my server. And when the bash, I forgot what the bash shell, you know, thing was, uh, I had to panic again and patch and update. Um, so those are your kind of three levels of choice. And the and, and you could, as you can already tell, they come with three levels of of uh, of, of value there, right? So the free service, uh, you know, a lot of people choose this. I actually don't recommend this, but. Uh, let me give you kind of the pros and cons here. So free service, what you're going to get is free, but you're probably not going to get to customize it very much. If you go to WordPress.com, you know, Tumblr, Blogger, one of those, um, you can do some customization, but you're probably not going to be able to uh, do all the themes that you want. You don't have total control of the software. 
You might not be able to install plugins or put ads or put shopping cart or things like that. Might not seem important to you now, but if you have success, you will care about all those things. So something to think about, right? Um, for paid hosting, usually like Bluehost is usually the one I recommend, but HostGator, you know, sim similar service, you're going to pay $10 a month. What they're going to, you know, the value there is that you actually control the, the software. So if you install WordPress.org, uh, WordPress software, then you could actually install plugins and themes and things like that, right? Um, and then for a virtual private server, this could actually be Azure or DigitalOcean, you know, Linode. You control it all, but you have to maintain it all. It's probably going to be the cheapest solution if you have a lot of traffic, right? But you're going to have to do the most work. So it, and it's the most flexible. You can install whatever you want. So Nginx instead of Apache, all kinds of cool stuff. But, you know, it's going to be cheap, but it's going to be a lot of work. Uh, let's see, i got a question here about what about GitHub-based blogs if they're routed to some personal domain? Uh, I think that's, that's fine. The only problem with it is that the, the customization, right? So I'll actually get to the next slide here and, and sort of explain it. So I actually suggest doing WordPress and, and Bluehost or one or the other. I mean, Bluehost is, is what I generally just, just suggest. And the reason why I suggest it is because it's, uh, well, okay, so let's talk about WordPress, first of all, right? I, I may mainly come from a background of, I mean, obviously I'm a software developer. You know, I, I do all kinds of, you know, Java and, and .NET and, and, uh, and mobile app development, and, and I, I, I run some, some Meteor code from time to time as well. But, but so why would I use WordPress? I don't actually program in PHP. Uh, the reason why is because WordPress runs something like, I, the last that I heard was like, 60% of, of the websites out there that are, that, you know, you know and, and people come up with that from different places. But regardless, it's a huge number. WordPress is by far the most dominant blogging and, and one of the most dominant CRM uh, software out there. And that means a couple of things. It means that it's easy. It means that you have tons of support, tons of plugins, tons of themes for it. So you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. So I, I use WordPress and recommend it because it's uh, ubiquitous. It doesn't, you know, it, it's going to connect. It's going to do what you want. You're going to be able to find help and support, um, and, it, and it's super easy. I'm not in the business of creating blogs, right? I, or of, of creating blogging software. I'm in the business of, you know, of promoting my content, promoting myself as a software developer through my blog. Um, and and then if we talk about the Bluehost side uh, again, I, I like the, the for someone starting out something where you control the 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 blogging software, but not necessarily the operating system, because it's hard to, I mean, DigitalOcean is great. I, I, I use it, I love it, but it's a lot of work, right? Someone, it's, it's a, there's a high barrier to entry, and you don't need to do that right away. If you just want to get started, you know, you can do a one-click install of Bluehost and HostGator and all those, those sites and have a WordPress software that you can customize, and you can upgrade to DigitalOcean later or Linode or whatever if you want to. Um, so let me, let me see, there are a couple of questions here. So, so that kind of answer, so that's what kind of my opinion on the GitHub-based blogs is I think they're fine, but I, I, I don't think you're going to get the, you know, the WordPress software is really, really powerful, tons of plugins and themes and stuff that, uh, that you're not going to get that with, with GitHub, but, I, but it's fine. I mean, it'd be better to, you know, use what, don't let the technology stop you, create a blog. If you want to ignore what I'm saying, go ahead. I mean, it, it's totally fine. The, the more important thing is that you, you create a blog because you you know, arguing over technology isn't going to get you the value you want. Um, let's see. So, uh, just looking here. So, um, N plus one issues. Uh, you know, uh, WordPress is not the most efficient blogging software, right? PHP, it's, it's got its share of issues, but but in general, I mean, you know, lots of big websites run it and, uh, and I, I have about probably like seven WordPress sites out there. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, so it, it definitely can, can suit your purpose. Okay, so um, any more questions on, on this? I don't want to get like too, like I don't want to get into a technology war on it, like, um, but, but if there's anything specific that I can answer, I, I'm happy to. We got Brandon Hayes is just giving his his support for my recommendation. I believe uh, uh, a good .NET solution. I don't know. Uh, 
I think Scott Hanselman is running DOS blog. I have no idea if that's good. Um, but again, just because you're a .NET developer doesn't mean that you, I mean, I'm prim I primarily call myself a .NET developer. Still, I still run WordPress. In fact, you know, I got Derek Bailey to run WordPress. And <laughs> I mean, people that are really opposed to, to WordPress just because it's just so easy. Like, you, you, don't, you really don't want to be in the blogging software, messing with blogging software. You want to write your blog and, and do your, your thing. And the, the platform should be, you know, should be secondary. And I do know some people have rolled their own blog. Uh, let's see. I, now I'll answer this one quick, and then I, and then I and move on here. So, how much value does being an open source software maintainer bring to the table? Uh, I blog about my stuff mostly. I, I think it, I think there's a huge uh, amount of value there, um, especially if it's a large project, right? Because if if it's a large project and, and people are looking for information about that topic, right? They they're they're going to appreciate having a, a, a blog out there that they can they can find your stuff. They, there's a lot of different topics. In fact, it's probably uh, worth sidetracking a little bit here just to talk about this idea of niching down. I talked about a little bit before in specialization. Um, basically, like when you start a blog, one of the best ways to be successful is to try to be a, a big fish in a small pond. So if you niche down. That's going to help you a lot, right? So, so what do I mean by this? There, there's this example I always use. I say if your garbage disposal breaks, right, then you go and you look for a plumber. And you see ABC Plumbing, and you see Joe's Plumbing, and you see Mr. Garbage Disposal Fix-It Man Plumbing. Who do you call? Most of us would probably be tempted to call Mr. Garbage Disposal Fix-It Man, and with good reason, because he's picked a niche for himself, right, specific to garbage disposals. He, he, he might be a good plumber in other areas, but, but he's picked one specifically so that he can be the big dog in that area. He can be the big fish in that pond. Um, and, and he's going to be able to uh, grow a lot faster than his competitors uh, because he's chosen that. So the same thing as a software developer, right? Uh, so, so you want to pick some kind of niche, some kind of specialization. And there's two general ways to go about this. One of them is to pick a very specific niche down technology, right? You know, for example, do Meteor JS mobile development would be like a niche down. I mean, Meteor JS probably it, itself is. Uh, you know, again, picking, picking on Josh since you presented last. But um, uh, you could be you could be the C++ pointer dude, right? You could be uh, you know the Android list view guy, right? They, these are really specific things. Uh, or 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 you could also have a different like take on it. Like you could be the angry developer, right? Or you know. The angry oriented, object oriented programmer, whatever it is, so you could you could be you know have a very very unique perspective on on this uh, you know the, the Zen programmer something something like that. Uh, that's that's the other way. That's a harder route to go. It's either easier to pick a specialization type of, of niche, but that's going to help you to grow because when you think about it, right? Um, there was a really good example in the .NET community. Uh, I, I don't know where where she is now because data grids aren't really being used anymore. But there was this uh, this girl called she called herself the Data Grid Girl, and and you could go to it, it doesn't exist anymore, but DataGridGirl.com, and that was ingenious, right? But guess what? She got to speak at conferences. Anytime someone wanted to do a magazine article on Data Grid, uh, that that um, <laughs> Gary, Gary Bernhardt, <laughs> yes, he has Connor the market on anger. But um, but anyway, um, she she would uh, you know she set up a really good niche for herself. So this is one thing you want to consider when you start a blog is try to come up with a niche. It's going to make it so that it's going to be easy to pitch uh, yourself for conferences, to get on podcasts, do all kinds of things because you'll be the expert in this very small um, area. And if you listen to a lot of podcasts, if you look at a lot of magazine articles, you know if you pay attention to kind of where there's really uh, where I would say kind of superstar developers. That that have a, a, you know a really good reputation or authority in an area, um, you can usually find these niches. Uh, a, a good one uh, in the .NET world recently is Troy Hunt, who made a nice niche for himself as being a, the .NET security expert. Right, he, he's he's really uh, picked that, and that's really helped him to grow his career quite a bit. Okay, so moving on, <laughs> let's talk about branding. Uh, so, in order to market yourself. It's, you're going to need to have some kind of a brand. Usually, you want to build some kind of a personal brand um, around. You can either do it around your name, 
or you can do it around your business um, or a combination of both. For example, my, my brand is Simple Programmer, making the complex simple. A lot of it has my face and my name around it, but it also is, is behind my Simple Programmer logo and my company, company name. Um, there's some pros and cons to, to either one of those. If you try to go with your name, uh, you're going to have a lot more traction because people like dealing with people, right? Uh, if, uh, you know, if, if Kraft macaroni and cheese tweets you, uh, that's not is, you're not as likely to interact as if, you know, a uh, CEO of Kraft macaroni and cheese tweets you, right? There, it, it's, uh, it, people like to have communication with people, not necessarily with companies. So if you're hiding behind, you know, a company logo, it's going to be harder to get that interaction. You're going to have to work harder to gain the audience, to gain approval and respect. But you know, there's always trade-offs, right? So the trade-off is if you use your name, you're not going to be able to sell that business, not very easily. Um, I don't think Oprah can sell Oprah, <laughs> right? She's going to be stuck in the middle of that business forever. You know, it's not going to have, um, you know, Tony Robbins is not going to be able to sell off his brand because it's, that's his, it's built around his name. Right? I mean, so, so that's one thing to consider. If you build it around the business, then you could potentially sell that business later on the road and step out because you're the, you're, you're, you're the Wizard of Oz, you're behind the, the curtain, right? Um, and that's why I chose a simple programmer. I sort of have the option of doing both either, right? I, can, I, I am the face of it right now, but I could sort of step out of the limelight and let someone else and, and make it more of a generalized blog. With, with more bloggers in there and then eventually sell the company if I wanted to. So that's why I, I went that route. Okay, so with that said, um, let's, let's kind of drill down into branding a little bit. Um, so a lot of, a lot of people uh, think that branding is just a logo, right? So branding is a lot more than just a logo. You can see a bunch of logos here from a, a lot of probably familiar companies. And that's how we recognize a brand, but that is not what a brand is. In fact, what a brand is, is really it's three things. Um, this, is, this is what makes it a brand. And, and yeah, Charles's brand is his pretty face. <laughs> um, but uh, but it's, a, it's a message, right? Um, it is a logo, right? There's, there's a visual aspect to it, or you could call this visual, and it's consistency. So what is the message, right? So, so here, this is probably the most important part of a brand, and it's something that you don't notice unless you think about it, right? We think about the logos, we see them. But... If you, if you walk into a Starbucks, right, and you could close your eyes right now and you can imagine walking to a Starbucks, can you smell, you know, can you, can you feel what it's like? Can you imagine what it looks like, you know, how the light is, what the sounds are, what the smell is, right? This is the message. This is really, you know, Starbucks is trying to send a very specific message when you walk into a Starbucks that says, you know, something around the lines of, we have premium coffee and we're delivering more than just coffee. This is an experience. This is a way to live your life. You should get a MacBook and you should sit here and you should pretend to be typing the next great novel while you're really not able to do anything besides plan Facebook because there's way too much noise to be typing a novel inside of a, a Starbucks, right? This is, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding a little bit here, but, but there is a clear message. Now, McDonald's has a, a message. Right, different companies, they all have some kind of message, and that is that is the core of the brand. Because you, when you are a brand, and you should have a message yourself, right? This is where we get back into that specialization. Your message should be clear about what you do. How many times do I shake someone's hand? You know, I meet them at a conference or you know, or, or, or a networking event, and they say, and I say, okay, what? You know, I introduce myself. And then I, I ask them what they do or what they're interested in. And they give me like this all over the place. They're like, oh, you know, I, I work for, first of all, they say, I work for company X, right? I work for, you know, such and such company. And, you know, I do this and I do that. And I also do C Sharp and blah, 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 right? And it's like, okay, not focused. Um, give me something very clear. Say, I am the Android list view guy and I do Android list view stuff. And I know everything about Android list view. Right? Give me a, a clear message about what you do, and that's going to be a lot more effective. Right? I'm going to remember who you are. You know, think about the people that you remember the most. Usually, they have a very clear message of what they're about. Uh, you know, and, and, and you can see this in the celebrity world. Right? There's a lot of uh, a lot of celebrities that it's like, okay, well, you could kind of characterize them as you know, this type of person or this this you know, 
know, stereotypes. They, they, they represent this thing. You know, uh, O'Reilly, right? <laughs> he represents a certain thing, right? His message is pretty dang clear. You know, you know what, what he's about. You know, uh, you know, Bill Maher, or, you know, any one of those, those guys, especially the political guys, they have a very, very clear uh, message. So, so you need to have a message of what your brand represents. Um, then you need a logo, obviously. Um, my, my good friend John Papa used his name, and he created a logo out of his name. Look at how beautiful that looks. That's great, right? Um, I found another one here, um, Tim Mather. I don't know who he is, but um, he did create a pretty cool logo out of his name. Um, and you can also create you know, just a logo for your company. But you need to have some kind of a logo uh, in order to have a visual aspect of, of a brand because that's what people see in repeated exposure, right? Um, if you notice a simple program or brand, right, my logo, um, hopefully have, over time you'll eventually recognize that and say, oh, that's a simple programmer. That's pretty cool stuff. Okay, um, and then you need consistency. So this is where a lot of people drop off. Um, you want to be consistent with your message, with your logo, with your visuals, uh, with your method of delivery. And I'll give you a good example here. If you go into McDonald's, right, and you and every single McDonald's had a different menu, uh, it, that would be inconsistent, and they would lose a lot of the value of their brand because you wouldn't know what to expect when you got there. Same thing with Starbucks or any any major brand, right? You you open up a, a box. I don't know why I'm so much into craft today, but of craft macaroni and cheese, and it tasted different every time. That would really hurt the brand badly. Right? It might be good, they all might be good, but consistency is key to a brand because when you know it's about setting expectations, right? When someone goes to your blog, they should know what they're gonna get. They should know the quality level, the type of content they're gonna get, the message, right? When they're dealing with you personally, right? If you're a freelancer, let's say, they should know what kind of service they're gonna get from you, what your you know, timelines and commitments and, and dedication is, how you respond, right? All these things are part of your message. And they need to be consistent. Otherwise, uh, it, it's it's going to be very difficult to convey that message and to build a brand, right? If you if you look at what I do every week, you know, if you follow Simple Programmer, you'll see that it's it's pretty consistent. I am pretty consistent with the message. I'm pretty consistent with the logos, with the colors, with with what I do, and that's important to establish a brand. All right, so let's uh, move on here. Looking to see if there's any. Questions? I think I think we're good. Okay. Uh, so branding doesn't have to be really expensive. It can be done really on the cheap side. One of my favorite sites on the internet uh, that my wife says that I'm putting us into the poorhouse five dollars at a time. Um, it's called Fiverr. It's at Fiverr.com, and it basically lets you hire people to do stuff for five dollars. Seems kind of silly, I know, but I have gotten logos created with Fiverr.com. I've gotten podcast intros created and outros created with Fiverr for five bucks. I kid you not. I've got the, the very slides you're looking at, you know, not the most beautiful slides you've ever seen, but someone created this slide template. I had no idea how to do this, right? And they did it for five dollars for me. That was a pretty good five dollars that I spent. Um, in fact, um, <laughs> Chuck was saying the, the, the hip hop outro that we got for the podcast. So if it, I don't know if you guys have, have heard of a uh, 10 second song. There's this guy that's super, like got super famous for doing these, uh, these he, he sings in a whole bunch of different voices, right? Or different styles of music. And he does like, he did, uh, does some famous songs in all these different styles. Anyway, you've probably seen the video on YouTube. Well, so this guy, he, um, he was on Fiverr, right? Before he got famous, he's like, you know, he's making lots of money now and he's super famous uh, and he's gotten viral millions of fans on YouTube. But before he was uh, famous, he was on Fiverr and I hired him to do the intro, the outro for the Entre Programmers podcast and to do the outro for Get Up and Code podcast where he sings a song essentially and he did it for five bucks. Now if you wanted to get this guy to do an outro for your podcast, it would be at least a thousand dollars. But so my point in that is that there's super like just because it's five dollars, don't discount it. There's extreme talent there that's getting started, and if you find the right people, you can really get a deal. So you know, don't like spend all this money and go crazy. Like just there's no reason why you can't get a logo for five bucks, or you can't get a, a simple site design and, and, and a lot of things done. If you want to start a podcast, you 
get an introduction created, all kinds of stuff for just five bucks. Um, for a little bit of bigger jobs, I go to odesk.com. This, you know, is still a, a really big value. You can get all kinds of work done, landing pages created, you know, website designs, WordPress customization themes, all kinds of stuff like that, um, and, and, and logos. Um, but you have to vet people out because you have to sort of hire people. In, in. So it's a little bit more complicated. It's a little bit more expensive, but you can still get a really, really good result for really, really cheap for like a fraction of the cost of, of what it might, you might pay a professional, you know, quote, professional designer that, that you hired uh, just, you know, from, from the standard means of hiring someone. So, um, so definitely is something that I recommend for some quick tips because I know people always ask me about branding and they, 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 they say, well, I would accept that. I don't want to invest all this money. You don't have to. Okay. So we're going to move on. Um, hopefully that's given you kind of a quick overview of what branding is and, and how you, you should start be thinking about what your personal brand is going to be, right? Remember, we're thinking the business mindset and how you're going to, what your specialization or niche is going to be, what your message is going to be, and how you're going to deliver that through your blog. But now um, what we want to, <laughs> it is a creepy picture. What we want to do is talk about social networks. Now, I'm not going to put too much emphasis on this. In fact, I'm going to fly through this because Social networks are not the best way to promote your content. In fact, you know, uh, it, it's kind of weird. You know, all the social media gurus would have you believe that social media is the social networks is the best way to build a brand and, and do all this. And the, the truth is, it's not right. Um, I, I've got maybe like I've got like around 15,000 followers on Twitter now. And if I send out a tweet with a link and 50 people click it, uh, then that's doing pretty good. Something like 50. 15,000. So it's not the best place, but you need to be there because brands, you know, if you want to market yourself, you need to be on the social network. So, so I'm going to kind of go over that uh, real quick here. So, so first one, Twitter, right? Twitter is a big uh, community of developers. Um, so you should have a, a Twitter account and you should not use the egg picture. You should have a nice uh, headshot. Uh, if you need a quick tip on getting a headshot, you don't have to spend a lot of money. The next time you do family uh, photos, just uh, ask the photographer if they would mind doing a headshot for you as well. Most of them would be glad to. Um, I'm sure they'll do it if you slip them 20 bucks. So um, that's a good way to get a headshot for cheap. But you should have a, a decent headshot. And remember, consistency, uh, if you see my face on the web, you're going to see this one headshot all over the place because um, I want someone to recognize that uh, as, as, as my, my branding around myself. Okay, so um, on as far as Twitter, I'm not going to go too much into the details, uh, but uh, one good way to build up Twitter followers is to follow people. <laughs> follow people who follow uh, people that are related to you, and then they'll follow you back, right? There's, uh, there's different ways to do this, um, but, you know, having more, more followers on Twitter means that you can spread your message to more people. But, again, Twitter has become so saturated that it's not a very effective communication medium. The noise uh, to signal ratio is very high, so don't expect people to read your tweets or to click them, uh, quick links that you send out. But you should, of course, you know, when you do a blog post, put it on Twitter. Facebook, you should be here as well. Uh, obviously, uh, this one, you know, you can, you can create a Facebook page for your business or for your blog. I created one for Simple Programmer. I also have a personal Facebook account that I usually, um, I will accept anyone who like has three friends in common with me because I'd rather reach more people and I don't post that much of personal stuff on there anyway. I, I use social media mostly as an outward platform. I don't really consume it. I, I mostly uh, you know, send content out from it. So, um, so, but it is important to have a Facebook page because people will look for you on Facebook. And you know, it's a, a lot of people are using Facebook, a lot of businesses. Um, a quick tip on Facebook, there's groups. If you join Facebook groups, this is a good way to get in contact with some really high profile people that might be running these groups that you might not be able to reach. Uh, and, and you can also reach an audience like in your, in your niche. Let's say that you want to promote your blog or let's say you're selling a service, a product, a training, or you're looking for a job in a specific area. Facebook groups that are targeted to that particular specialty is going to be a really good way to do that. A lot of people don't know about it. Um, Google Plus, uh, you should probably be here as well. It's not as important. Uh, 
you know, some people would argue, would argue that it is. If you're on YouTube, it, then it becomes a lot more important. But you should at least set up a page there. You can do the same thing like you can do with Facebook. Uh, not, communities in Google Plus are very, very valuable and useful. Um, I've been able to create some sort of viral campaigns and really get a lot of traction on blog posts by joining the right communities and posting my blog posts there. Um, I used it to, uh, to up the sales of my book when it launched. Uh, so the communities, again, it's, it's underutilized in, in Google Plus in a great way to promote your content. Uh, LinkedIn uh, is, uh, yeah, Hangouts are, are extremely useful as well. Um, LinkedIn, this is probably, I mean, you know, for professional for in the software development field, this is perhaps the most critical network. People expect you to be linked on LinkedIn. You should keep your LinkedIn profile updated with your current resume on there. And, um, and I've got a couple of different you know, tips for LinkedIn here. So first of all, make lots of connections. Um, I don't understand why people say I only accept people in my LinkedIn who I know personally or have met personally or shake, shook their hand or something like that. Because if you're trying to mark yourself and promote yourself, you want to have as many connections as possible. Now, LinkedIn doesn't want you to invite everyone and accept everyone's invitation. They want you to keep it tight because they want to have value, you know, quote, value to their network. But you, as someone who's trying to market yourself, go for it. Just accept everyone. I, you know, in fact, if you invite me on LinkedIn, I will, I will totally accept it um, you know, after, this, after this talk. And, uh, and, and, and you should do it too. Why not expand your network? Why not have more people that you can reach? Another big one with LinkedIn is asking for recommendations. So I know it's kind of intimidating and it's a little bit difficult to just, you know, to, to ask people for recommendations, but seriously, ask every single person you've worked with for a recommendation. Uh, this goes to the social proof, right? Um, most people do not, uh, do not actually do this, right? But I don't know if you've ever seen a LinkedIn profile that has like 50 recommendations on it. That's some pretty good social proof. If 50 people said that this guy was a cool guy to work with, that's probably going to help you a lot in your career. I mean, this this is a really big one. You know, just bite the bullet, you know, swallow the pride, go ahead and ask people for recommendations. It's a really underutilized piece of LinkedIn, and it's uh, and it's it's super good for social proof. Again, on LinkedIn, I'll say the groups, just like Facebook has the the groups and uh, the communities on Google Plus. There's a bunch of LinkedIn groups that you should be part of, especially if you're in some kind of specialty. Great way to promote your content, great way to meet people in your area, pick up clients, all kinds of good things there. And a lot of people don't utilize the LinkedIn groups. Okay, so how do you manage it all, right? I, could, so I sort of do this for my profession. So, um, uh, you know, I, I can spend hours a day, but I don't. I actually spend 30 minutes once a week getting all this managed staying current on all the social media uh, channels. What I do is I use a, a tool called Buffer App, and I, I basically spend 30 minutes in the, in the, at the beginning of the week, and I will uh, schedule all the tweets and Facebook updates and Google Plus posts that I'm going to do for the entire week all at one time, and this app lets you kind of schedule it out. Then I don't really utilize social media. I will read a message if someone messages me, but I don't consume it. I don't spend time during the week posting on there unless I you know, feel like it. But I can get, you know, I can stay relevant and promote my blog posts and promote my um, my my stuff and and, uh, and be putting out content on social media by by queuing it all up at the beginning of the week. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're running a little bit short on time here, so I'm gonna try and get get through this here. I thought we were gonna have plenty of time, but uh, I, so resume. Uh, this is a really, really important uh, concept for marketing yourself. And the reason why is because a resume is essentially an ad for yourself, right? This is how you really should think about a resume because probably for a lot of people, the only thing that someone is going to see about you is you're going to be your resume, especially you apply for a job. So, you know, an ad needs to be, uh, needs to catch someone's attention and, and seal the deal right there. Otherwise, it, it's not going to be very effective. Um, one example that I always use, you know, one piece of advice I have is is based around uh, getting a professional to write a resume. So, so here's here's something. If you've ever seen those brochures that try to sell you, like let's say, uh, you know, if you go to some resort area, like in Florida, we have them all over the place. 
these three-page, you know, full-color brochures that try to sell you staying at some resort or, you know, renting a jet ski or going to see alligators, right, that's in the Everglades or something like that. It's a nice, beautiful three-page brochure trying to get you to spend like $100 or $200, right? Um, so so that's, that's their ad. But how many times does a software developer come in and, and try to get someone to spend $80,000 or $100,000 on them and they have like, you know, this five page, double spaced, typo, full of typos, grammatical error, you know, ugly resume, right? You, you know, if, if someone who's making a brochure to get you to spend $100 can make it beautiful and, and effective, right? Then you asking for eighty or $100,000 should do a little bit better than, than the kind of job that, that a lot of us said. So I recommend getting a professional resume writer. I know a lot of people are opposed to this, but I think it's a really, really good investment in your career. It might cost you like three to five hundred dollars. Um, but you know, one thing I would say is, um, does the CEO of your company write code? Probably not, right? Why not? Have you write code? Why? Because you are the expert in writing code. The CEO might be able to figure out how to write some JavaScript, right? But he doesn't spend his time doing that. He runs the business because that's the most effective use of his or her time. So the same goes for you, right? Are you a professional resume writer? Are you a professional designer? Can you write you know, good copy? If maybe you can, if so then sure, then write a resume. But if not, then hire someone who's a professional to do that job. It makes sense, right? This is, this is it's not cheating, it's not being unethical, it's just business. This is all about business, right? So I highly recommend this, a lot of people have really been able to get ex extreme, extremely good results by hiring a professional resume writer to, uh, to, to write uh, the resume. So, uh, oh. All right, John, I'm going to jump in here for a second. Um, we are at 10 o'clock p.m., and that's when I told people it would end, but a lot of people are saying to just let you keep going. So I'm just going to let you give the rest of the talk however long it takes, and uh, – and then we'll do Q&A at the end as long as you're willing to stick around and as long as people want to keep hearing it. Sure. Okay. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try to, to speed along. But uh, thank you for, for, uh, for everyone who would like me to keep going. Um, so, so anyway, you know, on the resume side, I really recommend this. Uh, you know, it's not an unethical thing. Obviously, don't advertise that someone that you hired someone to do your resume because not everyone feels comfortable um, ab about that. But, uh, but, but definitely something to consider, you know, it, 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 and, and economically, let's say that you pay $500 to have your resume professionally written. And let's say that it'll, it allows you to get a 10% uh, increase in your salary, which is, is really quite reasonable, um, considering that you're going to have a lot more options. You're going to, you, you know, you, you think it in the, in the advertising copywriting world, we call it a pull rate, right? Which is basically to say like, you know, how well does this ad perform? So you could, you could measure your resume, and I've, I've had people that I've worked with that have done this. I said, okay, you know, take your resume, send it out to like, you know, 10, 15 places, whatever it is, and then count how many callbacks or interviews you get. Now get it professionally written and try it. And your pull rate could double or triple. That's not unheard of, um, especially if you have a really bad resume. And, uh, and, and that's gonna result in uh, more opportunities which are going to result in a higher paying job. So definitely this is one really big piece of advice that I give. If you're not going to do this, at least go through and make your resume as you know as good as possible. I've got some tips in my how to mark yourself course about, about resumes specifically, but you know, overall I'd recommend for most people to, to hire someone to do this for you. Uh, let's see, oh uh, cover letters. Um, so for cover letters, I would say uh, Again, a, re a good resume writer is going to write you a generic cover letter as well and then tell you to customize it for the job, which you know, someone who's giving you good advice is, is obviously going to, going to tell you this. Um, I would give you that, that same advice. Cover letters, again, really important. Um, you can, of course, write your own cover letter, but again, if you have a professional that's going to... Because the thing here is, is it's just like an ad, right? You, especially if you're applying for a job that has, let's say, a thousand applicants. They're going to scan through emails, cover letters. They're going to scan through resumes. You got to, you know, a good copywriter can make millions of dollars a year because they're good at writing ads and you know writing copy that catches someone's attention. 
a good resume writer might not be as good as a good copywriter that you know, that runs that makes ads for for multi-million dollar campaigns, but they're going to probably write some pretty good copy for your cover letter that's going to catch someone's attention, and that's really valuable because if that hiring manager you know scans it and they're like, oh, this stuck out to me. This is you know they they spoke in the right way because these people have experience writing cover letters and, and, and getting responses, then that's going to be really valuable for you. Okay. So let's. Um, this is where I'm the the last leg here, which is uh, getting your name out here. Um, so okay, you've got your brand, right? We talked about social networks is some way to get your name out there, but not the most effective way. We talked about resume. So how do you actually get your name out there when you have a brand and build a reputation? Uh, the big thing is about remember this. If you if you don't remember anything else about getting your name out there, your focus is to create value for other people, right? So, um, you know, Chuck is a great example of this because um, he does, uh, what, like five podcasts a week or six podcasts, um, and he's creating value for all these developers out there, right? Um, and he's not really making much money, if anything, from the podcast. Trust me, I know. <laughs> um, and he's got a few sponsors that keep him floating, but it's not really about uh, making money. It, it's about creating value, and then the downstream effect is that he's building a name for himself, and that is what's going to make him money in the long run, not the podcast itself. So creating value for people is, is number one. So getting into the ways to create value. Obviously, we talked about blogs. I think that's an excellent way to, uh, to create value. Uh, and there's, you can, of course, write on your own, on, own blog. Um, if you create content that's good, it'll get linked to which is going to get you what we call the SEO juice. So that means that when people search on Google, they're going to find your blog. Uh, more than 50% of my traffic usually comes from Google now. So that's 50,000 uh, people a month are finding my blog through Google. So uh, you know, writing good content that gets linked to is the main way to get that kind of traffic. Another thing you can do is guest post. You can borrow someone else's audience. This is a great way to uh, get your name out there. And then syndication. You can use things like DZone and InfoQ. They can syndicate your blog posts. My blog posts, a lot of them get syndicated on DZone, uh, and, and I reach their audience. So uh, a lot of people say, oh, I don't want them to copy my content um, and, and you know, get, get a free ride off of stuff I created. But you know, it's, it's a trade of value. You're getting a lot of exposure from their audience that you wouldn't get. So I say, hey, go for it. And anytime you have the chance to syndicate your stuff, uh, do it. Articles. Uh, you might not be able to write an article for MSDN Magazine if you haven't built the name already, but there's a lot of other smaller magazines out there. They're not going to pay you much money, but they're always looking for content, right? I mean, to, to publish a magazine every month, you've got to find a lot of writers, a lot of articles, and uh, so, so it's a hard job. So if you submit, if you start, if you made a list of all the magazines that you can find and you start submitting to them, uh, you could probably, you know, just about anyone that's listening right now could probably get an article published in a magazine. Like I said, it might not be MSDN, but you know, you've got to start somewhere. YouTube. Um, who knows this? Who, who recognizes this, this guy here? <laughs> Anyone? Chuck knows. It's, it's PewDiePie. It's, uh, he makes $3 million or more uh, on, on a, a year on YouTube. Uh, you know, uh, that doesn't mean that, you, you know, that, that you're going to make a lot of money off of YouTube. But YouTube is a great channel, and there is money in it. Uh, I use it uh, for, uh, from, for a lot of my promotion. Um, I do more of like motivational or inspirational videos, kind of, you know, kind of things I'm talking about here. But you can do tutorials on there, and that is a great great way to gain exposure because you know what the number two search engine in the world is? It's YouTube. That's right. It's Google number one and YouTube number two. So uh, people are searching for content on YouTube. Uh, it's a great opportunity, especially um, if you can get in front of a camera. You know, that, that's great. But you can just record a tutorial and, and that's a great way to get exposure, uh, to build a reputation, get your name out there. A really, really good thing to do and a good medium. Uh, another one here, of course, is books. It's it's easier than ever to self-publish. So you can uh, you can use something like LeanPub 
or Kindle Direct Publishing. There's sites out there uh, like Book Baby and Smashwords that will publish your book to your self-published book to all the different marketplaces. Uh, anyone can write their own book. It's it's probably harder to get a traditional publisher, right? A traditional publisher, especially today, they want to uh, have you know publish someone who already has an audience. But you know you can build your audience, and then you can use a traditional publisher to expand your audience even further and, and grow your name out there. I decided to. Uh, I did a little bit of self-publishing before I went to a traditional publisher, and uh, in fact, you know, because I had built up an audience, they had approached me about writing the, the soft skills software developer's life manual book, and and now I'm able to reach even more people. But books are a great way to um, to establish yourself as an authority and to to really uh, you know, expand. And like I said, anyone can self-publish a book, and you can even make some money doing it. Uh, to be honest, I know, uh, you know Josh Earl and Derek Bailey, uh, both in, in the Entreprogrammers group, they both have self-published books and have made uh, pretty good money, like over, I want to say that both of them have made over $20,000 on their book, self-publishing it, you know, without, you know, and, and it's helped build their name at the same time, so. Okay, so uh, another one is online courses. Uh, I've, I was able to do well. Uh, creating courses on Pluralsight. That's sort of an invite only type of thing like you have to apply for an audition. So not, you can't just, everyone can't just publish on Pluralsight you know, just because you want to, but you can try and it's, it's a good opportunity. There's other sites out there like Pluralsight, uh, like you know, lynda.com and other competitors where you can audition and then, and then you, know, you can probably usually have to have some kind of a reputation built up online. So that's not the best place to start. But you can create your own courses. I've done this. I sell courses online. Um, and Udemy is a place that sort of is in between because anyone can publish on Udemy and you can sell the courses. You just have to give Udemy, I think, 50% cut. But uh, it's, a, it's a platform that has a wide distribution. A lot of people search on Udemy. And, uh, and I know some people that have done really, really well on Udemy. Plus, it's a great way to get your name out there, what we're talking about here. Um, speaking, of course, you know, um, part of the reason why I'm speaking tonight is to help build my brand, get my name out there. Uh, you can go and speak at user groups, you can go to code camps, um, and then maybe you'll get invited to conferences or you can apply for conferences, right? There's kind of a progression here, but user groups will almost always let someone speak if you come up with a topic. Same thing with code camps, and then conferences are a little bit harder to break into, but once you have some speaking experience, you can definitely do that. And a lot of people have built really good reputations through speaking. Uh, okay, and then uh, podcasts, of course, right? We can't forget podcasts. Um, you can you can do this two ways. You can be a guest on someone else's podcast, which is a lot easier than you would expect. Uh, as someone who hosts a podcast and is always looking for people to interview, I know that you know one of the toughest jobs for a podcaster that does interviews is finding good people to interview. So when someone falls into your lap because they've emailed you and they've said, hey, um, I've got a, a good topic. You know, this is what I'd like to talk about. This is why it's relevant to your audience. This is why I'm qualified to talk about it. And this is when I'm available. That's beautiful. You send those four things. I don't know. We'd have to see if Chuck, Chuck agrees with that. But that's going to get you a very high chance of being interviewed on the podcast if you do those four things. Any, any, you want to comment on that, Chuck? Yeah, that's that's pretty much my experience. I mean, if you can come up with something that has value to my audience, you can tell me uh, why they should care, why I should care, and uh, what the value is, and then you can convince me that you're the right person to talk about it. Yeah, I'll yeah. get you on one of my shows. Cool. So, so yeah, so there you have it. I mean, that's. It, it, and it's, you know, the first time I was on, on Scott Hanselman's podcast, I basically did that. And I was amazed how easy it was. And then I did the same thing with .NET Rocks. And then once you've been on a couple, then you could use that and say, I've been on these. So, you know, and a lot of people have done the same thing. But if no one wants you on their podcast, that's fine. You can start your own podcast. There's plenty of room, uh, you know, for, for developer podcasts. There's like millions of blogs, but there's a handful of podcasts. And, you know, they, and they don't stick around for very long. They, they tend to drop off. Um, I've got a list of like all the podcasts. If you search for developer podcasts, you'll find my list. And you'll see that there's a lot of areas where new podcasts could certainly be created. Um, and it's a great way. I mean, you, you look at some of the 
kind of some of the most famous people in tech right now. Uh, it, uh, for example, you know, Scott Hanselman comes to mind because of his Hanselman podcast that's been running for so long. He's built up a huge reputation, mostly from that podcast. That's really where most of his, um, you know, .NET Rocks guys, you know, obviously uh, Chuck, Chuck has, has done really well with his podcast and he's, he's reaching, you know, how many ears every, every week uh, through his podcast. So it's given him a lot of opportunities, I'm sure you can, you can, uh, you can as you can guess. I mean, this conference probably wouldn't have been possible without Chuck reaching such a big audience through his podcast. Open source. I'm not going to talk too much about this one because I don't know a whole lot about this one. I haven't done a lot of open source, but I know a lot of famous developers who have gotten their, uh, built their reputation from open source. So if this is your thing, this is another great way to get your name out there and build a reputation. You can contribute to projects. You can start your own. And then we're coming right to the end here. So here's one thing I would encourage you to do. Search for your name on Google. Uh, whoever you think you are, whatever you think your brand is, what you represent, whatever the first page of Google says that you are, that's who you are. Because I guarantee you this, every, every prospective employer, every prospective client and customer, the first thing they're going to do is Google your name. And what they see there is what you are to the world, right? So you can think that you represent something and you can try to explain to people when you meet them, but people aren't going to meet you. They're going to Google you. And when that comes up bad or, you know, it comes up empty or is, you know, someone else <laughs> who has your name, right? That it doesn't, it doesn't help you. So this is something that I'd encourage you to do is, is, is look at that, see what that first page is and see if that first page is who you want to be represented on the web. If it's not, you need to market yourself. You need to figure out. Now, if you have an unfortunate name that's shared with a celebrity, well, that, that kind of stinks. But maybe then you need to figure out some other uh, branding or something that you're going to use uh, to market yourself. But don't, you know, don't forget to search and, 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 and figure out that. Because you, you want to, you know, this is a game that you can say, I'm not going to play this game. I'm not going to market myself. But that's a valid move in the game, right? That's, that's something, you know, if you choose not to play, you're, you're allowing the world to define who you are. You're allowing other people to say, you know, who you are. I, I'd rather control my own image than leave it up to someone else. Um, and then networking, again, we're not going to get uh, too much into this, but obviously networking is important. Uh, I kind of hit on this already. Uh, here's a couple of tips for, for networking. But essentially, do not try to think what can you get out of the relationship. Think about what value you can bring to other people. Joining user groups. Um, Talking about a famous person is a great way to network with them, right? Uh, people love to be talked about. So if you write a blog post about, you know, how cool Uncle Bob Martin is, he's probably going to notice that, and that's a, you know, that, that just gets you in, in in with him, right? If you write a blog post about a celebrity that that in in the industry, right, that's going to help. Uh, commenting on blogs is a good way to network. I I actually got a job that way, um, and reach out and help someone. You know, it, be, being a helpful person. You'd, you'd be amazed how much the word of mouth of being a helpful person spreads in, in our development community. Um, and so wrapping this up, we, I can't believe we went a little bit longer, but um, it, it, it keeps on like getting more and more content. Uh, so try to view yourself how others view you. This is the key to marketing yourself. What does your brand look like? What kind of message are you putting out there, right? This is, you know, just think about that. If you want to check out some more stuff, about this, there's just a ton of stuff you know, about marketing yourself. I do have a course out there at devcareerboost.com. Um, I still have the like the, my book code from from Ordev. The Ordev code will not work for my book, um, but you can check out my book at um, it's called Soft Skills. Um, you can search for it on Google, and um, and I will um, if you want a discount on the devcareerboost.com uh, uh, course, uh, I will give you the that the discount for hundred dollars off. Uh, I'll, I'll say just uh, let, let's just make the code uh, GS Remote Comp because I'm very creative, and I will activate that right after I get get uh, get off of here. But uh, but yeah, so um, I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, I'll give maybe like 15 minutes for anyone that wants to stick around and ask questions. If you want to use your voice, you can uh, click the Ask a Question button. 
Uh, otherwise, just type them in the chat, and then John can read them and answer them. See some typing going on. <clears throat> okay. Um, oh, oh, I see. Okay. Um, how many unfinished draft articles do you have in the hopper? I have one in the hopper right now. I'm I'm writing an article about you know the Joel test. I'm doing the simple programmer test, which is you know how it's essentially the Joel test for for, for software developers uh, you know, instead of for a company for a software developer. Someone gave me the idea, so um, I don't. I I typically like I keep a schedule and I make sure a blog post comes out every week. Every Monday a blog post comes out. Uh, you know it like it's do or die for me. I do not miss it, so I don't. You know, and I always ship it. So. I've written some of the worst blog posts that I thought was the crappiest writing ever became my most popular blog post ever. You know, go figure. Some of the stuff that I just, you know, that I I, I poured my heart into, like, it, we're just we're we're done. So you you can't know. You just got to ship. Uh, you know, don't write junk, right? You know, give it your best, but then ship it. All right. Any, any anyone else? I'll give uh, last last chance to ask questions here. Oh, no, nope, we have one. All right. You're on the air in here. Or he will be as soon as he accepts the permission to access his stuff. There we go. Uh, so I had a quick question about speaking at conferences. So. I've done a little bit of speaking. A personal project uh, that I like to talk about and, and is actually uh, kind of useful to me. Um, how hard is it to get to speak at larger conferences? Like, what what kind of process goes into that? So, so there's a lot of conferences. I'll be honest with you. Um, have somewhat of a good old boy system, right? They they tend to have the same circle of speakers, and you kind of get into the in crowd, and then and then you're you're more likely to be able to get them to speak at in the conferences. But that's not always the case, and it doesn't mean that you can't break into the conference circuit. Uh, you know, I, I would say that a, a good way is to start attending conferences, perhaps volunteering at them, because they always like volunteers. And getting in good with the organizers, or talking to people that are that you know are good speakers at conferences that have the sort of connections that you want, and 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 really, you know, if you have a video of you speaking at Code Camp or something like that, and you could send it to them, right, uh, so that you can kind of make this create these connections uh, in order to be able to speak. Another really good way is if you have a very niche topic or very specialized topic. Then sometimes you can bypass all that because if it's like you know this conference wants someone who uh, is going to talk really in depth about Android, you know, Android list views or whatever it is, or you know something very specific, then they don't have very many options. So you know a lot of a lot of conferences, there's a lot of people submitting beginner stuff, right? But if you're someone who can really be an expert in an area, uh, that they, they're more likely to take you because a lot of the attendees want you know, kind of the deeper stuff that is more than surface level stuff. So there's there's a few different avenues to attack. Um, I would attack multiple avenues if I were you. If you're really serious about becoming a, a conference speaker, um, I would try and you know network, figure out how many people that you know that are in your network that speak at conferences regularly, ask their advice, you know, um, talk talk to them, get into with them, ask them to make connections to conference organizers, see if you can volunteer or help out, things like that. And then and keep submitting, submitting, and and eventually you know you, you'll get the reputation, you'll get into that that crowd. I've seen a lot of people being able to set, successfully do that. Cool, thanks a lot. Yeah. Let's see. Um, I see a question here, kind of a loaded question. 
but what are the best ways to keep uh, your blog current and relevant? Uh, so let's see. So um, keeping your blog current and relevant, the best way to do that is to stay current and relevant yourself. I think that you know that things like that is not as, as important, right? Um, you know, some very famous bloggers like uh, you know, uh, the Darren Fireball guy and Seth Godin. They're, they're like Seth Godin is still on iPad, right? <laughs> and uh, and and John Gruber, Darren Fireball, he, he, his blog is not is not up to date on the latest technology. So uh, so as far as the, keeping the content current is, is the more important thing. Like, are you reading other blogs? Are you staying current in the industry? If you're doing that, if you're continually learning and self educating and staying current, then what you write about is going to be current. Any, any more questions? We had a question early on. I don't know if you answered or not. Um, but somebody, when you were talking about blogs, asked about analytic to, analytic tools. Oh, uh, let's see. So I could touch on that real quick. Um, obviously, the staple for analytics is Google Analytics. Um, real easy to set that up, especially if you use WordPress. You can just you know one click install a Google Analytics plugin and it will put the analytics tracking codes on your pages. Uh, you definitely want to have some kind of analytics so you can see who's visiting your blog and see what your traffic count is, but you don't want to be too concerned about analytics uh, at, when you're first starting out because it's going to, you know, it's going to take some commitment. It, it'll probably take a year of writing once a week before you really can see traction. So don't let it get you down until then. Take some time to get enough articles to get, start getting SEO traffic and get people noticing you. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the people who are consistent and committed are the ones who survive, right? It, it's kind of like and there, there's a lot of people at the starting line, right? And people don't pay attention to people who are at the starting line. There's so many of them. But when you get towards, you know, mile 20, uh, is it, you know, 25 of the marathon, there's less people. <laughs> and so if you're you're the mile 25er, you're going to have a lot more, a lot more pay, people paying attention, a lot more traffic. Just because you you're surviving. So, uh, let's see. social analytics for Twitter or Facebook. Uh, I don't know about social analytics for Twitter or Facebook. Oh, like, uh, what you mean like like clout or something like that? Oh, like retweets, like tracking those. Um, I mean, there's tools like Buffer will 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 show you like how well a, a specific tweet is, is performing, uh, and and you can test you can test different blog post titles using Twitter and things like that. I don't get too much into that because I don't think it it's so critical, right? This is like kind of micro optimization. I focus on your core. You know, if you're selling a product and you're you know working with conversions and things like that, then then maybe you get more into that level. But um, but I, for in general, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Let's see. How, how do you track other? How do you track other sites linking back to your site? So uh, so there's actually a protocol in the blogosphere. Of, uh, you know, it's uh, you know, it's trackbacks and pingbacks. So if someone is using you know a, a relevant blogging software and they link to you. Right, it will automatically send out over XMTP a, uh, a a request to your domain that will tell you that someone you know, it, it shows up. There's this, this whole protocol. WordPress implements it. A lot of blogging platforms do, and it'll show up as a comment on your site that says, you know, this person linked to you, and that that's how you can kind of track that. And the same thing happens when you link to other people if you're using a standard blogging software that's up to date. So that, uh, how you track that? Uh, if you want to be really explicit, uh, especially starting out, if you link to someone, send them an email and say, "Hey, I just wanted to let you know. Maybe you want to share this with your followers or share this with your audience that I I linked to you and I wrote up this article about how cool you are." So, okay. So um, I think that's probably uh, all I got. All I have time for. Uh, thanks, thanks everyone for for listening and and for uh, staying the extra extra time here.
And thanks, Chuck, for, for inviting me to this today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for speaking. Um, and thank you, everyone, for uh, sticking it out, uh, both tonight, because we went a little long, and, and over two weeks. Um, a few things that I want to put out there, I'll also be uh, talking about it on the community forum, and that is that I'm going to be sending out a survey to kind of get an idea of what worked well and what didn't, so uh, be aware of that. Um, big thanks to all of our speakers. Um, I am both delighted at how the conference went and relieved that I don't have to stay up another night after tonight uh, exporting the videos. So. Um, I I think we've had an awesome audience, and I'm super, super happy and excited with the way things went. So uh, thanks again. Um, the videos will be up on the forum by tomorrow morning, and uh, we'll just make it happen. If you want to get a hold of me, if you have any um, feedback or anything like that that you want to give to me directly, you know, feel free to put it into the forum or just shoot me an email. Um, and uh, we'll talk about it. So, uh, and John's saying in the chat that this count code is now live. So if you want to go save $100 on his course, that's what it was for, right, John? Then uh, then go use JS Remote Conf. And how long is that going to be good for? Um, I, I, we, we could make it uh, like a, the next couple of days. OK, sounds good. And if anyone has any questions for me, by the way, just email me at john at simpleprogrammer.com. I would uh, be happy to answer any questions. So. All right. Well, I don't have any other announcements or anything to add. So um, thank you again, everyone, for coming. And uh, uh, keep an eye out, because I am planning on doing this again, maybe for some other technologies. And so uh, I'll make those announcements. I'll send them out to the list so that you know. And then if you're if you're not super excited about those other technologies or other areas of interest, then you know you can let me know which ones you want me to do. And in fact, you can let me know, know that in the community forum as well. But that's it. So uh, thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and end this session so that I can get the videos and uh, get things rolling for you.